Do you know what does it mean by a restrained beam? When the top flange of the beam is connected to the slab with the help of shear studs, it is known as restrained beam. In today's lecture, I will talk about design of restrained beam as per Eurocode 3. This is part 11 of lecture series on steel design. For other parts, please have a look at the links down below in the description. Hey friends, if you're new here, I am Dr. Javed Qureshi, a senior lecturer at a London University. On this channel, we explore technical and human skills to help us lead more productive, happy and examined life. My today's topic is restrained beams. So if you have a look at this figure, the way the load path works is the load is transferred from slabs to secondary beams. So these lines that you see here, these are secondary beams. And from secondary beams, it is transferred to primary beams, which means that primary beams, they take load from secondary beams as point load. The loading from these primary beams will be taken on the column. But this column here is taking loading from this secondary beam as well, which is resting on column. Finally, the load travels through column and then it goes to foundation. This secondary beam, you can treat this secondary beam as restrained beam. Primary beams are normally designed as unrestrained beams. Now, what would be learning outcome of this lecture? The learning outcome would be that at the end of this lecture, you will know how to design a restrained beam and you will know design process to Euro code three. The beams which are unable to move laterally are termed as restrained beams. Beam is a bending element. So bending moment is the key criteria, is the key force in beams. Obviously, stiffness or serviceability is important. Service, serviceability means that it should not deflect so that it will cause inconvenience to the users, which is controlled by deflection limits. And then coexistence shear forces 50. I will talk about this. Why is the bottom point important in a minute? The second figure that you see here, it is a composite slab on top of the beam. Now, how do we construct it? We weld this round shear stud to the sheeting, to the beam. Then we lay wire mesh and the role of wire mesh is to con control cracking and temperature changes. And then we pour concrete on top of that. As a result, it will ensure shear connection between the slab and the beam. Now this ensures that the beam does not move here and there. It will prevent lateral movement. This example is example of hollow core slabs. We bring these hollow core slabs here on top of the beam. We weld these shear studs on the beam and the gaps that you see over here, we put reinforcing bar, I think 25 millimeter reinforcing bar, and then we lay in situ concrete on top of that. That will provide lateral restraint as well. Now, this is compulsory for secondary beams. Secondary beams can be designed as restrained beams. But if you want to ensure economy, then you can design as steel concrete composite beams as well. That will reduce the sizes of the beam. But my topic will not be steel concrete composite beams today. It will just be restrained beams. But you can design it as steel concrete composite beams as well for greater economy. If there are closely spaced bracing elements on a beam, it will be considered as restrained. And also, if you are applying load, if you are turning it other way around, and if you are applying load on top of that, then it will be considered as restrained as well. If you have tubular sections, rectangular hollow sections, circular hollow sections, and square hollow sections, if you use them, they have very high torsional and lateral stiffness. These tubular sections, they are unaffected by lateral movement, or they are unaffected by buckling. So we designed them as restrained as well because no lateral deformation happens. Now here you can see that we can have many types of beams. Most common ones are rolled universal beams, which can span between one to 30 meter. But most of the time we do not actually go beyond probably 10, 15 meters. If it is beyond 20 meters, I think we consider using trusses. And then we have different types of beams. The underlying principle remains the same. Underlying principle is beam is a bending member. So we must check bending. So now there are three things. One is bending, other is shear, and third is serviceability or deflection, which means that I should check restrained beams for three things, bending, shear, and serviceability or deflection. Now design process. Again, the design process requires us to check bending resistance, shear resistance, combine bending and shear, which is not very common in off-the-shelf beams, and then serviceability. Design checks consist of three checks. 
First is the bending check. It means that MED applied moment over MCRD or MPLRD, that is moment of the cross section, should be less than or equal to one. VED over VCRD or VPLRD should be less than or equal to one. MED is applied moment. MCRD is the resistance or capacity, moment capacity of the section. VED is applied shear and VCRD is the shear resistance of the section. The deflection, deflection in a beam should be less than the span over 360. This is a universal limit for beams which have plaster or which have slab on, on top of that. So this is the deflection limit, but how do we work out this deflection? It really depends on how you apply loading on beam. If it is UDL, load applied is W. This is in kilonewton per meter. Deflection is 5 W L power 4 over 384 EI. MED applied moment for UDL, as you know from level 4, is W L square over 8. And VED is applied here, which is equal to W L over 2. Deflection depends on loading conditions. If you have a central point load, then these values will be different. PL cube over 48 EI. This is the deflection limit for central point load. MED in this case will be equal to PL over 4. VED applied shear will be equal to load itself divided by 2. P is design load and small w is design load. This is what we know about applied loading. Okay. Now we know what is applied. W and P are design load. So 1.35 times permanent plus 1.5 times variable load. So they are design loads, which means we will apply factors. And here in serviceability deflections, loads are unfactored. Now, how do we find out the MCRD? MCRD is equal to MPLRD for class one and two sections. It depends on the classification. That is equal to WPLFY over gamma M0. This is for C1 and C2. And you already know that for class three, it will be W elastic. For class four, it would be effective from section classification. VCRD or VPLRD is equal to AV times FY under root three divided by gamma m naught for deflection you already have deflection limit now how do we work out av av is equal to area of the section minus 2 btf plus tw plus 2 r into tf it is actually area of the web now these are all design checks that need to be carried out tf is thickness of flange tw is thickness of web r is root radius wherever you see this term ED, it means it is applied. And wherever you see this term RD, it means that it is the resistance. We need to check three things, bending, shear, and serviceability. These are three main things. We have combined effect of bending and shear, but this does not really happen in normal beams. It happens when we have heavy concentrated loads, when we are designing plate girders, when we are designing, but normally this is not a big issue. MED over MCRD, moment check means applied versus resistance should be less than or equal to 1. And normally we aim for between 0.85 to 0.9 for economy. For class 1 and 2 sections, we will always have this formula, WPLFY over gamma M0. We use these two steel grades, but mainly we use S275 for beams. We use S355 for columns. For class 3 sections, we will have M elastic rather than plastic. So this will change it to W elastic. W is section modulus. In this case, it is elastic section modulus. Where do we get this information? Again, go to Steel for Life Blue Book and then get this information from there. VED or VCRD applied versus capacity should be less than or equal to 1. But in most of the cases, it is less than or equal to 0.5. Shear is not a big issue in building applications. And then again, this is the formula VPLRD, which I wrote a little earlier. AV is shear area. In our case, for I and head sections, this is simply area of web. So our assumption is that entire shear is taken by web, but it should not be less than new HW TW and HW is the depth of web. It is to be taken as H minus two TF. Again, shear buckling resistance of unstiffened webs should be checked according to section five. Shear buckling can happen if the web is not stiffened, but in building applications, it is not a big issue. Combined effect of bending and shear, 
VED over VPLR, if it's less than 0.5 or 50 percent, no reduction in moment is required, which is the case for most of the beams that we use in buildings. But just in case if VED over VCRD or VPLRD, if it is greater than 0.5 or 50 percent, then we consider the effect of shear on bending moment. It means that it will reduce bending moment. And for that, we will use this formula again. You don't really have to worry about this, but it's for your information that these things, they exist. So serviceability in Euro code, only unfactored variable actions should be used because serviceability is happening during service life of a building. According to Euro code, permanent loads should not be included. So, and maximum deflection must not exceed the deflection limit. The deflection limit will span over 360. Deflection limits, yeah, are not directly given in Eurocode 3. Instead, we use national annex. In Eurocodes, each country has got their national annex where they have their local provisions. Now, this is the practice for checking serviceability in Eurocode. Eurocode 3 says that only use unfactored variable actions or unfactored live loads, no factor, 1.5 factor is not applied. But in the UK, the common practice in industry has been because in the past, most of the design codes, they have been using unfactored permanent plus variable actions. So the common practice in the UK is that we use permanent actions plus variable actions to check deflection. These serviceability limits, again, do not be confused over here. Some students, they say that why there is a cube over here. Previously, I wrote 5W. L power 4 over 384 EI. Here, capital W is small w that is in kilonewton per meter times L already. So L is already multiplied. That's why it is capital W L cube over 384 EI. In our case, it was small w. Small w means UDL in kilonewton per meter. Capital W means we have load, total load in kilonewtons. So do not be confused by that. We have different formula for different configuration. For cantilevers, we have these formula, these come from structure analysis. These limits, again, they come from national annexia. This is the most common one that we use. So other beams except balance and sheeting rails. For roof beams, I think we use this one. But span over 360 is the most common one for beams carrying brittle finishes. I want you to take away a couple of things. Beam is a bending member. To design a beam, the main force that you need to design it for is bending. And there are three design checks that need to be carried out. One is bending check, other is shear check, and third is deflection check. Other checks, combined effect of bending and shear and effect of shear buckling, these two effects are really minimal when we are talking about use of steel beams in buildings. All design formula discussed in here are in this website bit.ly slash steel design. If you go to this website and no sign in is required, if you click on part 11 and 12 restraint beam, it will take you to this two page design recipe where all design checks are mentioned for steel beam.